Our panel discussion today is on new media art and experimental work with film. So at the JNF, we recently held an ex exhibition of um, artist Ampar Padamsi's um, work. And uh, you know, the exhibition, if some of you may remember, um, it had a very short run because uh, of course we had to close because of the escalating situation uh, because of the pandemic. But um, in the body of works that were on display, one could sense uh, the deep dialogue that is part of the artistic process. And uh, I think in Akbar's case, that dialogue included a wide range of subjects from philosophy to psychology to history and theories of art and aesthetics. So uh, this interdisciplinary and experimental approach to his practice is evident not only in Akbar's experiments with concepts, um, color and form, but also with uh, media, you know, through his paintings, prints, uh, drawings, and also his lesser known, uh, very retro looking computer graphics or rather what we would call retro looking now because these were his early experiments that he did with computer graphics in the early 90s. So, um, so you know, and I think uh, also for the less alone were his film um, experiments with film. And I think the reason that these works were sort of missed out or are not known um, so well is because, um, you know, they kind of don't fit into what is traditionally considered as um, art or film. So through the exhibition and its outreach, we wanted to explore not only the artist's own work and his legacy, but also how one reads um, or rather continually rereads experimental work into the ever-growing archive of uh, cultural history. So um, we have with us Nancy Adajanya. Nancy Adajanya is a cultural theorist and curator, and she has researched and theorized extensively uh, new media practices in India. And so we invited her to present her research and conceive of this panel. So the panelists are all uh, film professionals who have made or worked, um, uh, who have made or worked with uh, experimental film projects. All the panelists also share in common an association with Padamsi himself. They were either impacted by him through his, uh, his work or his vision exchange workshop, abbreviated to VIEW, uh, which ran from 1969 to 1972 from his apartment on Napiancy Road. And the thing about VIEW is that it was uh, experimental. It was also had this spirit of collaboration where he invited people from different disciplines, including cinematographers, uh, filmmakers, artists, sculptors, even a psychologist, an animator, and students of art to all sort of come together and you know work with media that they are not used to, like artists working with film or the other way around, you know, concepts of color and things like that. So it was, it really became one of these early spaces for experimental work, transdisciplinary kind of work. So with that um, background, I just want to briefly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, filmmaker Ashim Aluwalia works with archival film and the rediscovery of uh, lost works. He filmed Padamsi in 2016 as a process of recalling and recreating the artist's lost film called Events in a Cloud Chamber from the 1970s. Meg Harris Williams is a writer and an artist. Uh, she co-scripted with Kumar Shani, a memoir for the, of the future, which is an unfinished film from 1983 by Shahani. And Shani himself was uh, one of the leading participants in Akbar Padamsi's view or vision exchange workshop. Nina Sugati is an experimental um, uh, filmmaker and she was also associated with VU for a brief uh, period of time. Uh, three of her experimental films from the early 1970s were also um, made available in the run-up to this program as well as films by the other panels. 
So I just want to thank all our panelists for agreeing to be here and have this conversation. Meg, Oshim, uh, Nina, and of course, Nancy, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Nancy, now. Thank you to take the discussion forward. Thank you, Pooja. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you so much, Pooja, as well as the JNAF for inviting all of us to the session. And uh, a very warm welcome to all our panelists, Ashima Luwalia, Nina Sugati, and Meg Harris-Williams. Very happy to be here with all of you. So the roadmap for today is going to be uh, that we'll basically all make our brief presentations, and then uh, we will have a discussion, which I shall moderate. So I'll begin with my presentation, an exploded view. I'll just share my screen. Sorry. So is this visible now? Yes. And I think I'm just going to, I think this should be fine now. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. An exploded view. A few words before I tackle uh, the subject for the day. The other day I was catching up with Krishan Khanna. Not only is he one of our most distinguished painters, he has also experimented with photography as a studio practice and made ambitious photo murals in the context of world fairs and expos in the late 60s and early 70s. While we were expressing our disappointment and anger at the way in which the COVID catastrophe has been mishandled, Christian recalled a Persian verse that his father had often recited. And it goes, Ba yak lamha, ba yak dam, digargu me shuvad, eval e alam. With every moment, every breath, the state of the universe will turn over twice. I was intrigued by the state of the universe turning over twice with every breath. Why twice, I asked myself. We could imagine that the first turn alludes to the event and the second to reflection when you turn the event over in your mind. Today, we, we shall look at the experimental initiatives in Indian new media art from the 60s to the 80s and reflect upon them as they unfolded in their own time but also see how they fare with the distance of hindsight. I have borrowed the term exploded view from the discipline of engineering and architecture. An exploded view gives us an expanded visual inventory of the various working parts of a machine, many of which are not visible from the outside. For instance, gears, sprockets, belts, cogs, etc. In that same spirit, I wish to revisit VIEW or the Vision Exchange Workshop led by Akbar Pradamsi from 1969 to 1974 and to explore the various narratives and subjectivities that make up VIEW. But I would also like to reflect on an exploded VIEW, pun intended, the long arc of experimentation in new media art from the 60s to the 80s. In 2019, I curated a show, Counter Canon, Counter Culture, Alternative Histories of Indian Art for the Serendipity Arts Festival in Goa, where I contextualized a prehistory of new media art in India by bringing visibility to the underdocumented experiments in transmedia art, photography, film, and music from the 40s to the 80s. My central argument being that we can retrieve these alternative histories by looking in the wrong place. 
by wrong place, I mean places that are not recognized as legitimate sites of artistic production by the dominant art historical accounts. Some of those wrong places were, that I was looking at in, in, in the show were magic shows, expos or trade fairs from the 60s and 70s, transdisciplinary workshop like VIEW, design schools, schools like NID, activist collectives, architects, films and marginalia, nightclubs and youth subcultures and underground films. What I was also looking at are the degrees of complicities with the given mandate and the artist's inventiveness to secure her or his agency and freedom within these complex situations. So this was the first work uh, in the show in CCC. This is PC Sarkar, the magician, and I decided to use one of his posters, which uh, were used uh, for his tour of the Soviet Union. So you have the Cyrillic script on it, because he was a transnational magician who to toured all, all over the world. And um, it, so CCC began with a projection of PC, PC Sarkar. And in 1956, Sarkar made television history by appearing on BBC's Panorama program. And he had this performance where he would saw his female assistant in half. And as the program ended, he was of course supposed to restore her to life. But because he knew how to game the new media of his day, of the 50s, uh, he decided to use the televisual temporality and, the, and astutely use the editorial cut to uh, just create complete pandemonium. BBC's uh, phone lines were jammed by viewers calling in, convinced that uh, you know they had uh, witnessed an accidental murder in front of their eyes. So Sarkar knew how to use the new media of his, of his day. And I thought that this would be an interesting way to begin CCC by looking at the domain of magic, but also televisual reality. Um, this is Sarkar sawing a lady in half, an illusion that was performed on BBC Panorama in the 50s. I now move on to another wrong place, apart from magic shows, which is the expos and trade fairs. Krishan Khanna contributed two large photo murals, one for the Mines and Minerals Trading Corporation of India, and the other for the Shipping Corporation of India for the Indian Pavilion of Expo 70, Osaka. The brilliant composer Varun, uh, uh, Vanraj Bhatia, who died a few days ago, he composed the ballad, Balladila symphonic poem for this particular uh, photo, for these uh, photo murals. And while the world fairs were sites of competing nationalisms in, in the Cold War era, and in this case, of course, Japan was show showcasing its rapid economic growth in the 60s, and it also uh, wanted to dominate over Asia. So we can already see the geopolitics at work here. So on the one hand, you have these competing nationalisms being performed uh, in the Cold War era in these world expos. And on the other hand, they were also hubs of experimentation with the latest technologies replete with futuristic buildings, scientific advance, adv advancements in robotics and telephony. So India, of course, had to be projected in this pavilion, both as an, as, uh, as an ancient, but also a modern nation, a modern nation with, of course, an emphasis on rapid industrial progress. So Kanna was already experimenting with um, uh, you know, with, with composite photographs and multiple projections in his studio in the 60s. But uh, he decided to become more ambitious when he was um, commissioned to make these photo murals. So he made these large photo murals for Expo 70 Osaka. And what you have here um, are, uh, are, are, are photographs of these on-site photo murals taken by Madan Mahata. And these are rare photographs. They have never been seen before. And they were seen for the first time at the CCC. And Madan Mahata, uh, and Krishan Khanna worked in collaboration with Madan Mahata to make these photo murals. And they both visited, uh, Khanna and Mahata, both of them visited the Beladila site, rich in uh, iron ore in Dantwada, Chhattisgarh, and took hundreds of photographs. And then Khanna projected all these photographs on different surfaces and created a composite collage 
of the multiple projections. And as you can see, the final result is very dark and spectral with glimpses of excavation machines, a lone Adivasi woman with a head load, just a speck. So as I started looking at these, uh, at the documentation of these photo murals, um, I could clearly see that uh, what Kanna is doing is not to just perform a valorization of India's industrial advancement. Um, the overexposed penumbral images um, don't allow us to see the present horizon in the photo collage, nor the future. And the shipping mural, um, it, uh, it, it makes a very minimal intervention as compared to the mining one. And you, what, you, what you actually see is a, is a photo composite of a man, what looks like a mandala. And then um, Christian had painted uh, the waves uh, you know, uh, 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 below, below the mandala. And um, here again, what looks like a mandala is actually made out of these rotating tankers. Um, so, uh, and, and one of the tankers sort of, it, 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 it just sort of leaves the mandala just, just a little bit. And, um, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, you know, you, you, you can already see that this is not a mandala of wholeness or of healing, but there's already a certain kind of schism there. And uh, uh, one of the things that I argued in this, in, in CCC, uh, in my exhibition didactics, uh, didactics for this photo mural was to say, talk about how Kanna used photographic abstraction to create uh, ambiguities in the celebratory discourse of the expo. So uh, you, you, on the one hand, he's complicit within the national mandate, but on the other hand, he's also secreting these ambiguities through abstraction. So, so as you can see, um, the, the, the artist on the one hand is being inventive uh, in terms of ambition, scale, medium, format, uh, but he's also uh, in, in a way embedding his own position into this particular narrative. This is Dashrat Patel uh, with his nine, this is another, um, an, another expo. This, uh, the, the earlier one we saw with Krishan Khanna was Expo 70 Osaka. This is the Montreal Fair, Expo 67. And you have uh, uh, Dashrat Patel, uh, a self-portrait of his uh, with these nine, uh, nine, uh, uh, nine, a nine screen projection all around him. It almost looks like he's broadcasting from outer space with these star bursts and um, on, on, on these uh, nine, uh, nine screen uh, murals, you, uh, uh, you saw photographs which, which can only be explained as auto-orientalist uh, because these are basically street scenes, uh, scenes of Indians, uh, Indian uh, people at work, scenes of Indian people at worship and so forth. And of course, uh, it was um, it, it was it it, it was uh, uh, it, it it was something um, quite ambitious for Dashrat Patel to uh, create first of all a contraption of nine cameras around his neck, um, and then he had a, sh a remote shutter. So when he when he photographed uh, these particular these uh, these Indian scenes, he would he he would actually get a circarama or or a three sixty degree effect. Um, so, so you can already see the different kinds of inventiveness at, at, at work here. And especially in a situation where we did not have the latest technology, but we have these artists who, who are working, who are using their imagination and not thinking in terms of lack, but thinking in terms of, uh, you know, of, of, of fullness, of, of finding ways in which uh, they, they could actually uh, fill the lack uh, in terms of technology or any other kinds of historical lags with, uh, with, with, with their own uh, ingeniousness, their ingenuity. Uh, one of the things that uh, while I was researching for CCC happened was that, of course, uh, I knew about the Dashrat Patel nine screen installation uh, because of uh, Sadanan Menon's book on this subject. But um, uh, what, what, what has not been uh, researched so far was uh, Gita Mayer's um, sonic collage for this, uh, for the Montreal Pavilion. And um, in fact, uh, I was able to play her sonic collage 
at CCC alongside uh, these uh, archival images of the Montreal Fair. And what happened is that when you only look at the auto-orientalist auto scenes of Dash, uh, that Dashrath Patel has shot for the ninth screen installation, you get one side of the picture. But with the sonic collage, you realize that because uh, when he's doing, when Dashrath is doing photo documentation, uh, he, he's in a way illustrating Indian reality from a, a particular perspective, of course. But what Gita Sarabhai is able to do through this very eclectic sonic collage is that she's able to work with the abstraction, with abstraction, which is a quality that is inherent to music. So she is able to, in a way, cut against the grain of this, of this auto-orientalist photo. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, um, of, of this multiple projections. And uh, her, her collage um, source, classical music, folk music, film music, um, also found, uh, found music. Um, and, and therefore, again, I, therefore I was able to also, in a way, bring in um, a gendered subjectivity, Gita Mayani Sarabhai, into this narrative through this uh, new research, and, and, and perhaps uh, add more layers to, to, this, to this lost history. Um, Dashrath Patel worked on ambitious ninth screen installations uh, at expos and world fairs, but in the 80s, uh, he also started working in rural areas. One of the images that you see here is um, uh, of him making a hand-built um, projector. So in the rural areas, pe when people don't have electricity, um, uh, you know, activists felt that they could not show a lot of their um, material, uh, AV material. So therefore, uh, Dashrath created a, a projector with uh, cardboard boxes and um, uh, magnifying glasses. So, uh, so, so again, you know, we see his inventiveness at play here. Um, there's uh, Ram Brahman and Neil Chattopadhyay. Um, Ram Brahman, uh, uh, while, while researching uh, the, 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 the 1968 countercultural um, uh, you know, terrain, uh, he, through, through, in his research material, in his archive, he found uh, the Cellar logo. The Cellar was, uh, the, cellar was the, the first discotheque in Delhi. And, uh, and, 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 and um, what we did was that we created a room for Ram Rahman and Neil Chattopadhyay, who was this um, uh, you know, uh, guitarist of this legendary Atomic Forest band. And I, put, I brought these two positions together with the seller, uh, seller logo uh, in common. And uh, you have their narrative, their lives being played out on this uh, seller, logo, seller, lo seller logo of 1968. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, you, 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 you look at uh, this anti-authoritarian countercultural stance within this, their photo uh, collages, but you, but you are also actually uh, seeing how, uh, because India was, uh, was, was, uh, was non-aligned, uh, because of the non-aligned position, uh, uh, we, uh, there were also these various Cold War circulations. And uh, in, in this photo collage of Ram Rehman's, you also see a delightful cover of Sputnik magazine where he is, uh, you know, dancing um, Bharat Natyam, um, uh, one of the episodes from, uh, from, from Ramayan, for a Russian audience of, um, you know, I mean, of school children. Um, there's Kiran David, Junk, 1986. Um, it features the, the, the rock star poet Jeet Tyle. And Kiran David uh, was, uh, was, was making a film where he would actually work with the materiality of film itself. He was destroying the film, letting fungus grow on it. Um, he was just letting the film fall apart. And according to him, he, he wanted the film to disintegrate because he also wanted to show what heroin addiction in a way does to the body. But of course, he wasn't making some social documentary on the subject. It is a, 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 a a poetic intervention, um, and for that you need to to see junk, which uh, which was uh, you know much loved by the audiences at CCC. Um, Akbar Padamsi with his Bolex camera. So now we are moving towards view, and uh, I have of course there were forty two positions at CCC. So of course I, I've only shown you a little glimpse of the exhibition. And uh, one of the reasons why I was, uh, why I also wanted to show some of these uh, different uh, experimental interventions is because I did not want to just fetishize the vision exchange workshop um, because people know a little bit about the workshop today, but uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to show various interventions to look at various wrong places, which then spawned all these different artistic positions. And, um, 
view as already Pooja has given you a, a, a background to view by talking about how it's a transdisciplinary workshop. It brought together the psychoanalyst uh, Udayan Patel. Um, it had filmmakers uh, like, um, uh, I'll just come back to this, like, like um, uh, it had uh, filmmakers like Kumar Shahani, um, uh, cinematographer K.K. Mahajan. Uh, it, had, uh, it had the painter uh, Gif Patel, who made a film there uh, with K.K. Mahajan on chairs in an Irani restaurant. The, this restaurant and the, 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 the film is lost, unfortunately. Um, there's Prabha Mahajan, who had a first screen test for Shahani's, um, uh, Kumar Shahani's Maya Darpan at PU. Uh, there's Mani Call who made Duvida, uh, which was part financed by uh, Akbar Padansi. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll come to memoir of the future. So uh, to begin with, perhaps what we need to do is to uh, familiarize ourselves with what was Akbar Padamsi's motivation behind starting VIEW. So when he, uh, when he got this uh, fellow, Nehru Fellowship in 1969, at first he did not want to take that fellowship. I remember, I mean, going through my notes, uh, which I had taken many years ago, uh, where I, I was just reading yesterday night where he talked about how, uh, you know, he just felt that, you know, he was privileged enough and he did not need that fellowship. Uh, so, so when he finally relented and decided to take up the fellowship, it, he did not use that money and invest it in a studio practice, the solitary studio practice. Instead, what he did was that he decided to cre create a space for experimentation and collaboration. So in, instead of just talking about how he felt uh, uncomfortable with the fact that he was so privileged and he did not need the fellowship, he owned that privilege and he used that to, he, he shared his privilege with others. He brought in like-minded people and they had discussions on mathematics, music, philosophy, uh, uh, Sanskrit aesthetics, and much more, psychoanalysis. And oh, you have the statement here, what we do not want is to form an institution because although at first it may help liberate the creative potential, later it can have an inhibiting effect and act as a deterrent to experimentation. We want to set up certain values and the research work that we do can in time become authoritative." Close quote. So I think that this is, this is a very important statement by Padamsi. And what he was doing was that he did not want to create an institution which would then get, uh, you know, muddied, um, uh, you know, by, uh, by bureaucratism and red tapism. What he wanted to create was a live um, interactive space uh, where, where experimentations could be conducted. And, uh, and he wanted to nurture other practitioners, other worldviews. Uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Akbar was always known to be a nurturer, uh, whether he was, uh, you know, whether he had created view um, for experimenting in film and photography and printmaking, or whether it was younger artists like um, Atul or Anju Dodia, who are painters, uh, he was always nurturing people at large, uh, you know, I mean, he was always available. Uh, what we have here is Nalani Malani, who uh, then goes on to become a, a pioneer of new media art in India in the 1990s, a, a rare archival image. Uh, so when I was showing uh, some of the, uh, the archival materials from, from View, uh, which I found in the Pandol family collection. And uh, this one is called Tragic Tree. This is a photogram from 1970. So they were experimenting with these photographs and you have um, a, a, an invite from the Pandol Gallery. So this is really a rare brochure. You have Nikki Padamsi, Akbar Padamsi's brother. So Nikki and uh, Nalini, they were all experimenting and mucking around in the dark room. So you have Nikki Padamsi's images of violence, where he was taking images of uh, violence you know, in, in relation to the, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, so American imperialism in Vietnam, the Cambodian War. And then he was, you know, I mean, he, he was exposing them at different uh, rates and creating these composites. Um, Kumar Shahani made obsession with, um, uh, you know, based on a, um, a, uh, a, 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 a psychoanalytical case study that Uden Patel shared with him. And uh, 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 this film exists, and I, was, I, I tried my best to show it during CCC, but unfortunately, we could not transfer it. There were various technical reasons for that. So, um, so we did not show that, but then there were many other things that I showed, and I'll come to that. Um, and KK Mahajan um, uh, sh shot it. 
uh, KK Mahajan, we've already familiarized ourselves with him. Uh, Geef Patel, I've already told you about the film that he made, Prabha. Uh, Money made Duvida, as I said already earlier. Uh, in 1973, it was, uh, uh, and, and uh, Padamsi helped him to uh, financially to make the film. Uh, Padamsi also worked on a color axis for Kumar Shani's Maya Darpan. So we had a, a rare archival footage uh, courtesy Bhanu Padamsi uh, in the exhibition where uh, Padamsi is, 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 uh, makes notations for the color axis for Maya Darpan, talking about how it uh, begins with these colors, yellow, yellow, orange, uh, talking about the desert scapes, uh, the claustrophobia of the home, the claustrophobia of the desert, um, then a, a, a single uh, blue scene, which is of the blue nude, uh, referencing Kali, and then the, la the last sequence, which has these uh, uh, aqua green and blue uh, images of the river scape, uh, uh, connoting freedom. Um, so, uh, as I said, we could not show Kumar's obsession, which was which was made during the workshop. That I decided that I, I mean that that there were there were other works that perhaps you know I could actually think about. So, looking at the afterlife of uh, of of view, for instance, Kumar Shahani uh, was uh, he, he actually it was Uday Patel who told Kumar Shahani about Wilfred Bayan's uh, the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bayan's work, and uh, that's how. Uh, Kumar Shani and Wilfred Bayan began to uh, research um, uh, uh, towards uh, making uh, a memoir of the future. And uh, uh, the memoir of the future is co-scripted by Meg Harris-Williams and uh, Kumar. And Meg is here with us. She's going to talk in detail about this experience. So I'm not going to go, on, go into it right now. But I just want to say one thing, which is that why did I choose this particular film? Because again, Uden was a commonality. Uh, and uh, and and uh, the obsession also dealt with um, with with questions of you know I mean getting pregnant and and all the connotations that go with getting pregnant and I think that there is a certain link between obsessions obsessions and a memoir of the future and we could perhaps draw that line and we could talk to Meg about it later. So I was so I just thought that perhaps there were ways in which you know uh, things that 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 began at view then radiated out. And that there was a possibility of also looking at, you know, I mean, things that had radiated out. And therefore, I showed a memoir of the future, uh, which is an unfinished film, by the way. Meg will tell you all about it. And um, Akbar Padamsi made Sizigi, uh, but he also made Events in a Cloud Chamber. And uh, it's uh, Sizigi, uh, we have a bad print of it, but luckily, at least we have it. Uh, Events in a Cloud Chamber, unfortunately, is lost. Um, Ashima Luwalia, who's on our panel today, will talk all about uh, making a film about this lost film. Um, whenever we talk about the Vision Exchange Workshop, you, you realize that um, experimentation in the late 60s and 70s in, uh, in India, in, in, in the new media context, was always dominated by male artists. And one of the things that I was also trying to do was to, to see whether I could create critical notations or annotations alongside archival material from view and, 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 and secrete a gendered subjectivity or perspective into this very male dominated view. So I was, uh, I remember uh, long years ago, Padamsi had told me about how uh, when he made these drawings for Suzuki, so he, he devised a mathematical code and then he made thousands of drawings based on that code. And, uh, uh, and then Ram Mohan animated those drawings. So I was, I was going through uh, Nasreen Mohamadi's photographs and I was looking at uh, Akbar Padamsi's drawings and he, I remember him telling me that, uh, you know, he had shown these drawings to Nasreen and she loved them, the drawings for Sizigi. And you, I mean, I don't have to explain why she loved them because of course they're extremely minimalist and you can, you can see a convergence of, of, of worldviews here. And what I did in the show was I had her notations, diary notations, I had Akbar's notations on Sizigi, and then I, 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 I just uh, put together, uh, parallelly speaking, um, a detail of, uh, of uh, the Fatehpur Sikri, uh, uh, you know, with alongside one of the drawings from Sizigi. And as you can see, there is a surprising affinity between the two. Um, and um, 
and then of course I had also other uh, artists. Uh, I had Pallavi Paul's, um, uh, you know, work on the Playfair Code, uh, which was used by secret agents of, um, you know, during the uh, uh, Allied um, uh, by by the Allied secret um, uh, agents of World War II. And um, so again, I was looking at how do you actually um, look at the modernist grid. Uh, questions of authoritarianism, questions of communication. So I, I brought in Nasreen Mohammadi's, uh, you know, uh, uh, notions of addressing the grid. I brought in um, uh, Pallavi Paul and her notions of addressing the grid and the code, the mathematical code. Um, this is uh, Money Calls Before My Eyes, 1988. So. Uh, uh, when I was doing, when I was, uh, you know, thinking about how to uh, display view uh, at CCC, I decided not to show uh, clips from Duvida, but instead I sh I decided to show Money Calls Before My Eyes, which was made, of course, much later, uh, you know, in 1988. And one of the reasons was that uh, Before My Eyes, uh, in a way, has a kind of surprising affinity with um, Akbar's Metascapes. Uh, and um, and and uh, before my eyes, which is a, uh, it is a film on Kashmir. It's a, it's a, it's it's a documentary, but of course it's 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 uh, it, it's 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 an experimental documentary because it it's not uh, it's not telling you about the uh, about the everyday life of the Kashmiris. It's it's it is uh, a it is it is it is a it is a it is a, uh, it is a kind of poetic take on the the landscape in Kashmir, and uh, what you find is sumptuous and unbearable beauty uh, in the landscape shot beautifully by uh, uh, Piyush Shah. And what Manikal was basically working on is before my eyes. He was actually borrowing a um, uh, he was borrowing um, notions of um, of of um, of you know what what of pratyaksha and paroksha. So these are um, these are terms that he borrows from Sanskrit aesthetics. Uh, pratyaksha is what is before your eyes, what is retinally visible, and pratyaksha. Uh, prat, uh, pr sorry, pratyaksha and paroksha. Paroksha is is where it is beyond the retinal, and the the point here is that you have to go through the pratyaksha, what is before your eyes, to arrive at pratyaksha. Par to arrive at parosh. <laughs> Forgive me. Just a minute. Um, I think I've lost my link here. Uh, Do forgive me for this interruption. So, um, as I was uh, talking about uh, what he's borrowing, what Manikal is borrowing from Sanskrit aesthetics, pratyaksh, what is obviously visible, and paroksha, that which goes beyond the retinal and the visible. Now, um, this this film also, um, you know, it has this uh, alap in Rakshri, which is played on the cello in Drupad style by Nancy Lesh uh, Kulkarni. Um, but there is no sign of any political turbulence in this film. And uh, while I was working on CCC, uh, uh, in the run up to the CCC, uh, 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 what we actually uh, saw in the in the newspapers was uh, that Kashmir was um, was in uh, was was under lockdown. There was extreme brutality and repression in the valley, and um, uh, because of the abrogation of Article Three Seventy, uh, and uh, and and there was no way in which I mean I I could actually just show money calls before my eyes uh, without having without having a critical political annotation. To this film, because uh, the whole point of this exhibition is not not to be nostalgic. It is not to fetishize or valorize any of these narratives. It is always and very importantly to also be critical and to see what is relevant for our times. And that is why uh, what I what I did was that I brought in um, the film by the uh, by the band Alif, uh, uh, and the film is called Jailimus and uh, made in 2016. And it is about the, the kind of psychological uh, trauma that Kashmiri women have been facing since the late 1980s because of uh, the political turbulence uh, in Kashmir. So, uh, so, so, so 
the important thing was that you know when when people walk into CCC, uh, they are able to also see that this show uh, you know is not just historically important, but it's also politically relevant, and that it, that we should only retrieve things from history, um, archives, objects, artifacts, if they mean something to us, uh, you know, if they speak to our urgencies today. And with that, uh, I would like to invite um, Ashim Aluwalia to speak about events in a cloud chamber. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Nancy, for that. Um, so I guess, you know, within this, within this context of view and, and the art scene uh, and this sort of quite radical art scene in the 60s and 70s, I have to say that I came to this uh, very much by accident. And I want to talk a little bit um, about my own personal kind of interaction with Akbar and, and how I ended up making this project because it was something I didn't know anything about. You know, a friend of mine, there's a writer called Lalita Gopalan who's uh, academic and she, she teaches in the States. Uh, she called me one day and she's like, uh, you know, do you know, do you know the, uh, the painter Akbar Padamsi? Uh, you know, he wants to meet you. And I, I'm, you know, I, I really don't come from uh, the art world. So in a way I was like, of course I know uh, who Akbar is. He's like a stalwart of Indian modern art, you know, but I didn't know much about his work or his painting because I think honestly, uh, if, I have to, if, I, if I have to be uh, sort of direct, I think as a younger artist growing up, I always felt like people like, you know, Padamsi, Raza, Hussein, uh, Jangi, Sabawala. I always thought about them as the sort of establishment. You know, I thought about them as cultural heavyweights that kind of dominated the conversation. Um, and, you know, as a younger artist, I didn't really like that. I, I, I always felt like, you know, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be much else. There's only these guys. And, you know, I wanted radical figures. I didn't want these guys as my heroes. And that's really all I knew. I didn't know much really. So. So Lalita tells me, you know, Akbar is keen to see some, you know, she was, he was keen to see some recent film work, you know, people working in a more personal way with cinema. He asked me to share some work and I showed him uh, your film is lovely and he really likes it and he uh, wants to meet you. So I, I couldn't understand. I was quite curious. I said, okay, let me, let me sort of engage this. I had no idea what he really wanted to talk about. So I go over for tea and we like uh, start uh, chatting and obviously, I'm a bit intimidated, you know, it's, uh, this is the Akbar Padamsi. And, um, and then he starts telling me, you know, I, I really like your film. Uh, I like the colors. And, and he starts talking about Joseph Albers and uh, interaction of color and color theory in relation to Miss Lovely. And I, I was really kind of, uh, I love Albers and I love color theory. So I'm kind of blown away by his whole take. And he just takes off in a completely different direction. And I'm not, I'm not really expecting this. But um, I, I didn't know where this was going. I said, okay, let's have this chat. And it, you know, obviously it was great to be in the presence of somebody who had lived through this art world of the forties and fifties and we start chatting. And then he says, you know, uh, I used to make films. Um, it's a bit of a kind of a secret uh, and I want to make a film again. And I knew nothing of the fact that he had ever made films. I always thought about him as this famous painter and um, then he says, uh, do you have uh, 10 minutes? Can I show you this film I've made? And he pulls out this like very low resolution BCD, very compressed, and he puts it on and it's, uh, it's Siziki. And it just, I, I don't know what to say because suddenly there's this film on his, on his TV screen. It's an animated film, it's from 69. It's just made up of dots and lines connecting the dots in these various permutations and combinations. Um, and it's silent, it's black and white. And I'm just kind of mesmerized because it's super beautiful. And I was just kind of like, what the hell is this? I had no idea what this was. And it was quite unbelievable. And he was strangely very vulnerable. He was almost nervous to show the film to me. So the minute I saw this, I was like, there's nothing like this in, in Indian film history. I mean, I've never seen anything. I know that nothing like this exists. And, um, what was really amazing was that it felt so futuristic because it, even though it was completely handmade, uh, he had made the whole thing himself on 16, on 16 millimeter film, just with an animation stand frame by frame. But it was made, as Nancy was mentioning, it was made with a code, it was made with an algorithm. So it was just dots and lines joining the dots in various permutations, mathematically calculated, um, almost like it was made in a computer. And it, even though it was totally analog, you suddenly, I was looking at this piece of like three digital 
uh, like almost generative art. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is just something else. This is a different Akbar Padimsi completely. Uh, it looked kind of like the paintings of like sort of Agnes Martin, but it had this futuristic, very graphic quality. And honestly, I was very blown away. And then he tells me uh, something which really kind of uh, shook me up. He said, you know, I don't show this to anyone because everybody hated it. And um, I sort of hid it away because uh, I was told never to show it. And he uh, said, you know, all my friends said, you're a famous painter, stick to painting. Uh, film is not for you, so don't embarrass yourself. And uh, so I never showed it to anyone again. And I was shocked by this. I was just, it was like a different angle. Um, and he just said to me, I think, you, I just thought you might appreciate it. So I thought I'd show it to you. And here there was a complete different take because I was not expecting this. And that at this moment, suddenly uh, Akbar doesn't seem like an established artist, uh, establishment artist at all to me. He just seems very vulnerable and, and, and totally radical, you know? And I'm seeing him uh, with a completely new set of eyes. So it's like this, he's playing this established painter by day, but really he's like the secret avant-garde filmmaker by night. And I'm honestly totally in awe of this. So um, then, then he throws this other googly, he says, uh, would you want to collab now? He's 89 years old or 88 years old when we met, uh, since 2013 or 14. Um, and he says, would you like to collaborate with me on a film? <laughs> I was like, so this tea and biscuit session is now to, taking on like a very surreal dimension uh, because this was literally our first meeting. And clearly there was a chemistry, we could connect. And, and he almost felt like he, he felt comfortable enough sharing this film side now, I'm in a very strange spot because at that moment, I'm working on a big film called Daddy. It's a gangster film. It's a big film with stars. It's studio money. And I just thought this was a one-off meeting. But the film that I'm working on is making me quite feel quite distant from the act of making uh, at that moment. I'm not feeling very connected to it because it's very big. Not that I don't like it, but it's just very large. And I feel quite far from the process. And suddenly, his proposition seemed quite you know, inviting because... I thought, let's, you know, making something secret and personal, just the two of us together and, and something that we didn't need to share or to explain with the world. It just felt so, like something that I had really wanted to do for quite a long time. And I was quite removed from the practice of making something small. So I really wasn't sure, but I kind of was excited about this proposition. And I thought, okay, let's, maybe we can do something together. I said, did you ever make anything else other than Siziki? And that's when he tells me about this other film called Events in a Cloud Chamber. And he says, well, there was one more film. It's called Events in a Cloud Chamber. And after just a handful of screenings, this film, which was made on positive, it was shot on 60 millimeter reversal, which means there was no negative. This film was shipped off to an art expo sometime in 1970 in Delhi, and it was lost. And there was no, since there was no negative, the, the film is completely lost. Now, in my head, I'm thinking this could have been a start of an entirely different kind of cinema movement in India. This could, we could have had our own experimental film tradition, uh, the artist film tradition, and it was sort of killed before it even began. Uh, one, of course, by the public humiliation of trying to make something that doesn't fit the canon, exactly linking back to what Nancy's saying, is this that, and I, I'll be a little bit, <laughs> a bit more vocal about it. I think it's not just about the canon, it's about how the canon destroys the ability to make real artistic work. Because what happens is you're meant and you're asked to do the same thing again and again and again. And the things that you do, which are truly beautiful and experimental and, and, and in fact, the things that you really want to do are kind of hidden. So I, for me, it was, it was not just about meeting Akbar, it was about a sudden discovery that there was a different kind of cinema in India uh, that could have happened, but it was never meant to be. So I suddenly thought, okay, I think we have a movie that we can make together. I wanted him to try and remember this lost film from memory, and I wanted to try and make it again with him. And that's a very weird thing to do because film is so concrete, you never think about it as an oral tradition. And I thought, what if we make it from this, this memory, this oral memory, and he just tells me how he made it. Now, I, I really didn't want that period and that kind of cinema to be forgotten. And, and of course, I realized that by this point, uh, Akbar was getting very old and, and his memory was failing. 
So that's the film we made together. I kept the original title. I felt like it was very important to keep the original title. So the film that I made is also called Events in a Cloud Chamber and it was made in 2016. So in essence, um, my, my version of events was essentially to get him to remember the original film. And it was just asking a very simple question. Can a, thought, a lost film be made from memory? So it took a few months. I tried to listen. I documented and I reenacted how Akbar had made the original film. I did a lot of recordings with him where he became very comfortable and very vulnerable with me. And I think because maybe I wasn't from the art world, I was a complete you know, outsider. He felt more comfortable to tell me about things like view and the politics of view, for example, and how he had an idealism and how it all fell apart because the artists all were on independent uh, trajectory, career paths, and everybody was taking and not enough people were giving. So what started happening is I became a sort of, I don't know, I became a sort of year for Akbar because he felt like he could talk to me. And we started talking and I started recording these conversations. A lot of the recorded material, of course, because it named names and it was quite, I would say it was quite angry. I did not use in the final film. But what we did do is I got him to try and explain how he made events in a cloud chamber. Now he could often lose himself in a maze while explaining this process, you know, but I figured that around 69, Akbar had, a shot, had shot it on him, himself on a 16 Bolex, uh, 16 millimeter Bolex camera, the one you see in the photograph. Um, and the film ran for about six minutes and it featured a single image, which was um, like one, from one of his own oil paintings. He experimented with this kind of cut of paper and, and with a carousel projector and colored gels, he had superimposed all these different shapes that he had isolated, almost like Photoshop layers, um, but had done it manually by winding the camera back and reshooting over and over again. So you had all these static shapes that were stacked on top of each other. But because the camera had, it, had its own life, the whole painting had this sort of hazy, dreamlike feeling. And um, we tried the same technique again, you know. He tried to remember, he redrew the painting uh, on which the original film was based. He recut the stencils, which was not so easy for him because at 89, his hands weren't very steady anymore. And I just filmed the process. I filmed the process. We tried to film it the way it was originally made. Um, and we tried to make that six minute film uh, using an old school, you know, analog technology using 60 millimeter film, um, a slide projector and some colored gels, you know, that you get from a stationary shop. So the whole thing was like very lo-fi, very analog. Um, and it was the complete opposite of the project that I was working on at that time. But, but you know, the film looks like. Um, even he isn't clear. He wasn't clear anymore when we were working on it. There wasn't, there weren't more than a handful of screenings. Almost nobody remembers seeing it. And uh, like I said, the only print was lost. So there's no photographs of it. Um, there were no diagrams or stencils. Uh, and if there were, none have survived. And the soundtrack, which I'll talk about in a sec, was also the tape was so deteriorated that the soundtrack is inaudible. So essentially what this is, is a ghost uh, project. It doesn't exist, except um, I almost began to believe that this was just in his mind. He had never made the film. And um, we tried to, to do this from memory. His stories were hazy. Sometimes the process was hazy, but he did eventually pull out a very concrete object. And the only thing that told me that events actually existed, which was, the invitation card for a gallery screening from 1974, which showed um, that they did in, indeed screen the film and it was actually a screening of it. Um, so this was like, like I was saying, it, it's like the eeriness of ghost stories, you know, and this was one in a way. On one hand, we tried to remake this lost film, uh, Events in a Cloud Chamber. And on the other hand, I think my film became um, like sort of an excuse uh, to understand what it means to be an artist and, and an artist as you age and as you near the end. And um, more than just the about like, you know, the disappearance of an artwork or a movement. Um, it also suggests, uh, I wanted to make a film which was really about, about mortality, I guess, and, and death. Um, and it's a personal matter for me because I think about my own end a lot. And I also think about art and um, 
does it even matter that we make art you know uh, so these were the kinds of things that i was talking to akbar about um and so my version is not really a remake of the original lost film but it's really about vanished art and death and, and i guess the phantoms that we sort of leave behind. i i can just show you um a quick image and um sorry this was i don't know if you can see that image there but that's us making it and it's really handmade you know it's us making um events again that's more on the dp uh, um and we kept it here on 16 uh, used or and trying to make the film again and um i kept this end bit the remake just the remake of 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 his uh, vision of events at the end of my film um on 16 mm because that's how the original was shot now it's quite funny because more than my dop you know who thought i was truly insane to make this uh because he had been shooting with shahrukh khan the earlier day uh the day before on raise with a crew of like hundreds and the next day it was just like him me and like two of us kabir who worked with me shooting events literally four of us or three of us making this film and um basically i shot all of akbar's portions with um I chose not to shoot it on digital because I just didn't feel like that that captured what we wanted and I shot all of upper portions on a old Nizo Super 8 camera from the 70s that would barely turn on that I had borrowed from someone um Mohan and himself had shot only big films or you know stuff he was complete version of Super 8 despite having shot on every other format there was no eyepiece on the camera that I was working with um there was no way to focus it there was no way to tell if the the cartridge was even exposed um and i think there was something very magical about that uh, i wanted this dream image an image uh, like I, i guess what nancy was mentioning an image that's falling apart the, an image that's deteriorating as you see it um and this is something i think i learned uh, from akbar you know that about the magic of not being in control i think too many artists now with digital formats are all it's all about control and i think there's something to just let go and i just let go and all the images that came back to me have this kind of ghost presence that i can't explain because they just came back in a way which i did not expect them to so even the collaborative nature of this project people just working together for love i think uh, came from the idea of view that we can all work to make something magical together you know so this is something i'm really interested in and i think coming back to um you know coming back to what what nancy was saying that sorry that um that i'm not just I, i'm not that interested in just taking from the past you know from akbar's film or treating all of this history as static and frozen but actually making it like sort of live uh again and and engaging with this as material for new forms and for new films and for new works not to just go back and fetishize or say oh how cool these guys were doing this in the 60s taking from history making new things that's what i want to do i don't want to enshrine this stuff i don't want to turn it into a fossil for a museum because i think that's what will kill the spirit um that these guys had i think what we really need is the continuity so i was very happy that up got to see the finish uh before he bomb is to see his take on the film and and he was the one who said you know don't do what i did don't hide it don't hide it like share it with the world and um, you know we sent it out and we were very lucky it was uh, it uh, it had a premiere at the venice film festival it opened there and it went on to show all over the world and it what it did as as a result in a weird sort of way is that it created a new global interest from museums and galleries and cultural institutions in akbar's film work that he had buried all these years so it opened a kind of new chapter and i think that's what connected me to nancy is this idea that you know there were hidden histories and there was some really cool stuff being made that was just suppressed because the time didn't allow for it or it was just considered out of its context or whatever so one of my dreams is to actually restore siziki which is the only uh project of his film project that actually exists there's a very deteriorated print and i'm trying with banu padam to see if we can somehow its original celluloid glory so you know i was very saddened to note that the event soundtrack which i want to talk about for a minute 
uh, had been destroyed because it was a very, very rare experimental soundtrack made in 1968-69 by Gita Sarabhai. Again, somebody when composing in the 60s using modular synthesizers, using electronic uh, instruments. Now, this is a radical figure, and I think is, she's a radical figure that we're going to be hearing a lot about uh, now. I think she's going to be someone that we're all going to go back, and, and in five years, we're all going to be talking about how Gita Sara did this in the way that the BBC Radiophonic Workshop was dug up, or Daphne Aurum, or all the other electronic stuff, uh, women making electronic now being sort of rediscovered. Um, but I feel what's really sad is that by the time we dig this up, all the work is gone, you know. Now, um, you know, when the film was done, I felt that the film was more suited uh, to working with an art gallery in a way because I, I, it didn't have a place and uh, I didn't know where it fit. It did, definitely didn't fit in the film world. It didn't really fit in the art world. But um, Javeri Contemporary was a gallery that was very ex interested and excited. And they said, OK, we give it a home. So they gave me the, the gallery as a sort of, and it gallery was, that was based in, uh, in a flat. It was originally a flat in Naples Road where View started. It's an old school flat, South Bombay. And it just had this energy that I thought this could be an interesting way to screen the film. So what we did was we essentially, um, I'll, I'll share some images now. We set it up a little bit to have the resonance of the original flat. So I don't know, you can see these images. Can you see these images here? Yes. Ah, okay. So that's that's actually a, an image of Akbar uh, when he was young and and quite a hipster there in Paris. Um, this is at the time when when he actually went and met Andre Breton of the Surrealists. He was he was a very cool guy actually. And this is an image, one of the rare images that actually is a still from my film events in the Cloud Chamber. Um, that on the left hand side is actually the last. That's the tape that has a soundtrack on it, which we played in the film and. When we played the soundtrack, of course, uh, the, the tape had been uh, oxidized, so like there was no there was no sound on it, so it's just missing. Um, these are images from the film itself. Some of these images have come from my granddad's own uh, home movies from that time, which were very badly deteriorated. This is the same period. He was sort of from the same milieu as Akbar, you know, forties uh, Bombay, and there was these amazing images. Uh, that were totally uh, deteriorated. And I think there was something so alive in the way that these images were decaying that I think it felt very connected to this whole idea of, of death and decay. Um, of course, an image of Akbar there, not shot on Super 8. That's a digital image from the, from the film. Uh, making, again, painting, repainting the same image that was used in events in a cloud chamber. Um, this was some images really talking about the reaction uh, which where the, the first screening of Sizigi was introduced as uh, by, by somebody, the person, the moderator introduced it as to the audience as, well, we're going to show you this film, but everyone should take an aspirin before because it's going to give you a headache. That was the first time the film was ever shown. That was um, Bhavnagri. That was actually John Bhavnagri. I'm trying to be polite here. Uh, yeah, not very nice to Akbar, honestly. Uh, he was the head of the films division at that time. He was extremely powerful man and did impact the fact that it did cause trauma to Akbar to never show the film again. That's the painting from our film, the recreation of events in a cloud chamber. And um, that's an image uh, of Akbar falling asleep at the end of the film, which um, I am I'm, I'm very fond of because I feel it. It, it gave us a side to this, which was not just the artist, it was a, a, a fellow human being and it connected me very much. So um, again, an image from the film, naturally deteriorating like that, no post-production done, it's just falling apart at the seams. I mean, at some point it must've been a, a very beautiful home movie. That's my aunt uh, from 1941. And that's the original color, but it's just become like an abstract painting accidentally just with time. Uh, another image like that. And um, that's me and Akbar at the gallery when we installed the show. So I'm very happy that he got to see it uh, together at uh, the gallery, which is where we eventually screened the film for the first time. A lot of the text on the walls were writings and letters from artists uh, and from Akbar and, and his brothers and, and his brother and, and artists to each other about the projects they were working on at View. 
So um, what we did was we showed the, the film in the context of a kind of apartment where you could hang out. And uh, what you see on the wall there on the top left side is actually the original drawings of Siziki, the, the, the images that were animated. And what ended up happening is that a light bulb ended up burning a hole into those original images. And so I just decided to show it like that with that hole burnt in. Um, you see the hole is burnt in there and those are the images. So, you know, and we also showed Suzuki on a little, on a little screen. Uh, you can see the book with the hole burnt in. You can see the, the, the slides and the, and the pieces of black uh, stencil and the lines, markings, the way we made the film, which is very, very, like I said, DIY. Um, and, you know, that was the layout of the gallery. That's the hole. And, and the letters and, and, and correspondences. So whatever was left of you that we could get our hands on was in that, was in that room. So when people got to watch my film events, uh, the collaboration that we did together, they got a context of, you know, like you can see Sizigi on a, on a TV from that moment. And of course the screening room itself within the gallery where the work was shown. Um, talking about, of course, here, Gita Sarabhai. Um, so, you know, we, we gave it this resonance of a latency road flat. And I just was very amazed, honestly, at how vibrant, collaborative and open the Indian art scene was in the late 60s and 70s, early 70s, not just in painting and film, but in experimental uh, music, performance, design, architecture. Uh, there were so many attempts at collectives, artists working together, a kind of multidisciplinary approach. And I really honestly don't feel like we have a lot of that today. Uh, now it seems just centered around individuals and, and careers. It's not as, um, as open and there's a lot less sharing. So, you know, in a way, I think loss uh, is often associated with sadness. Um, and this film sometimes is seen as one of loss. But I think it can also be a foundation for something new, you know, with a missing artwork taking on a second life, uh, like a kind of reincarnation. Um, for me, this, was a, uh, this is a way of situating my own filmmaking. Uh, within the tradition of other artists, uh, in this case, Akbar, who had tried to make something very different over 40 years ago. And it's just that the world wasn't ready for it in, uh, at that point. And I think that his radical, unique filmmaking and this whole, whole enterprise, this whole project was at the risk of being forgotten. And I'm really happy that uh, we didn't, I mean, I didn't want that. And I'm really happy that today we can come back to this and say, you know, um, yeah, like hopefully we can revive that spirit. So that's, that's basically... Uh, uh, my take on this. Thank you, Ashim. And yeah. I think that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take your point, uh, you know, into consideration, which is that uh, a lost artwork doesn't only have to be about loss or lacuna, but it can also be about something new being born, yeah. a sense of reincarnation. And yeah. with that, um, I'd like to move on to Meg Harris-Williams, who will share her story about co-scripting a memoir of the future with Kumar Shani. Thank you, Nancy. Um, that was that was very fascinating, actually, and it, it it brought um it brought to mind a lot of connections with the making of this film, which um Kumar and I and his friend Udain Patel, who Nancy's told you about, the analyst who is now dead, of course. Um, well, this goes right back to 1960, 1979, um, <clears throat> when uh, Kumar and Dudain um, came over to England and um, arranged with the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion uh, to make a documentary film about his early life in India and its influence on his later psychoanalytic ideas. Well, Kumar and Dudain came over, they arranged this with Bion. Bion was going to go back to India for the first time since his childhood, since he had been um, um, sent to school in England at the age of eight, as, as people were in those days from, you know, in the days of the Raj, people were sent to school in England at a very early age, which caused huge trauma, of course, but they didn't realise that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so Bion himself um, had not been back to India um, for the past sort of 70 years. And he really wanted to go back and sort of revisit his childhood and Kumar and Udain were going to make this documentary about him and um, but it, it was almost like fate so at the moment that Bion had arranged to go back he sort of suddenly fell ill with very acute and vicious leukemia and died within a few weeks just suddenly 
just like that. So <laughs> this idea, it was almost like a stroke of fate had come to sort of nip this reconnection with India in the bud and it was completely dead. And so, um, so you know, here, here's another case of trying to bring back to life something that um, seemed to have vanished and can you give it another form? So, um, so Uday and Kumar's idea was instead to make a film about Beyond, but that was based on a very strange autobiography that he'd written. Beyond actually wrote two autobiographies. One was a kind of literal one called The Long Weekend, and that was actually published later. At the time they came over to talk about this film, um, it was a much weirder autobiography that had been published called A Memoir of the Future. And that's really the jewel of it. That's, that's our favorite, you know, so that was what we really wanted to base it on. But his literal autobiography kind of told some of his childhood events in a way that kind of made sense of the memoir. Um, and um, I was a student of liter literature at the time. My mother and stepfather were psychoanalysts. And one day uh, there appeared on the, on the kitchen table a copy of this book called The Dream. And they said, what do you think of that? <laughs> um, and it was the first volume of the three volumes of A Memoir of the Future, which, which are called The Dream, and then The Past Presented, and then uh, The Dawn of Oblivion. Um, wonderful titles, all of them. The second one is a quotation from Milton. Um, so I, I read the dream and I said, oh, this is fantastic. You know, I love, I love this. And um, they said, well, um, write something about it. So I did. Um, and I was actually the only person, even though I was a student in those days, I was the only person who actually taken any interest in this weird autobiography. Um, and I, I wasn't interested at all in being on, as an analyst before that, even though I was brought up amongst psychoanalytic ideas, but um, I wasn't particularly interested in the theory of it at all. And it was only reading this memoir of the future that got me interested in Beyond. Um, <clears throat> and um, I came to realize a lot of things later actually, one, one of which was that my father who had recently died had been in analysis with Beyond uh, before he decided he couldn't stand it any in London any longer and he sort of ran off to California in order to be for a breath of fresh air for something different because he couldn't stand the sort of pressures of the London psychoanalytic society. And um, when he went off to California, they all thought he'd gone mad. Um, so when he produced this, these three, the three volumes of this memoir, they just said, oh, he's gone completely senile. Um, he's, you, know, he's, you know, he was very clever at one time. He'd been the president of the British society and they decided that he'd just gone bonkers. Whereas actually it's by far the best thing he's ever written. It's got all his ideas in it and kind of it's a much more sophisticated and aesthetic kind of level. And you see the links with, um, the links with all the arts in it. It's a kind of absurdist sort of fantasy drama really. Um, you know, it's a little bit like Beckett. It's a little bit like Bernard Shaw. It's a little bit like Milton's Samson Agonistes. It's a little bit like a sort of Dylan Thomas radio play. It's, it's a mixture of all these, all these genres. Um, and since I was only looking at it as a literary student, I thought it was, I thought it was great. And that was at the very point at which Kumar and Udain came over and talked to my mother and stepfather and um, who the analysts, uh, that's Martha Harris and Donald Meltzer, and said, you know, will you help? Can we do anything? What, what ideas have you got about how to, um, how to rescue this project that, that never came to pass, um, you know, beyond reflections on his on his life in India, on, on the influence of his early life. Um, and so they said, well, you know, here, here's, here's, his, here's his memoir. Um, and they thought it was great as well. And so we just started to, we just started to write it. Kumar would come up with a scene um, and there were loads of discussions. And then he said, can you write the dialogue for this scene? So I said, yeah, yeah, I'll write the dialogue for this scene. So, cause I was quite well versed in I was quite good at remembering in those days, all these phrases just flashed into my mind, which I sort of said, oh, I like this phrase, I like that phrase, I like this sentence, and <laughs> sort of put them all together in a, kind of, in a kind of pastiche. And the very first scene that we wrote was called um, Heaven. Um, and when it came to be filmed, it was filmed in the, in the Jamna Bagh. Um, I wasn't actually there when it, 
the filming took place because I was expecting a baby at that very minute, so I couldn't go. I was I was terribly disappointed, but um, at least they did manage to film some of it. Um, uh, so that that was how anyway that was how we sort of we started to write it, um, and then they got together a most amazing collection of actors who. Nobody knows quite how, but sort of one, you know, one would invite another and would, would invite another. And we had people who either then or later was, became actually, you know, fa famous names in, act in acting. You know, we had sort of Nigel Hawthorne, Angela Pleasance. Uh, we had Alec Nanda Samarth as the Iowa. We had Tom Walter as, um, as the father of Bjorn when he was a little boy and so on. And we had, yeah, we had some really great actors. Um, and then for various reasons and accidents and so forth, which I won't go into, um, the film was never finished. Those few scenes in India were shot, which is all we've got now. And there were meant to be an equal number of scenes shot in England because it was meant to interdigitate England and India in a very particular way. And we never sh shot any of the film of, about the war as well, because what this memoir goes, the, the, what this memoir covers is the early years in India, the childhood at school, boarding school in England, and beyond years in the First World War as a tank commander, and how all the imagery from um, the trauma of the First World War kind of has a kind of reflection or a kind of advanced reflection, as it were, in his, in various partly traumatic, partly comic, partly just emotional moments um, from, from, his, um, from his childhood in India. Um, so we wanted to shoot it, um, or rather we wanted the film to be not exactly a literal autobiography, but a kind of dream, so that all the various episodes that are shown in it um, kind of link up with other episodes, not necessarily looking back in memory, but looking forwards into the future as well, because after all, Bion had called it a memoir of the future. So uh, things that happen in the war are kind of prefigured sometimes in his, in his childhood, either at school or his very early childhood in India. Um, uh, so, you know, we wanted it to be that he's, he's putting layers of, layers of his own history, one on top of the other. And in the same way, some of the characters um, have both a realistic existence and a fantasy existence. So they have one existence in his daytime life and they kind of, reappear at nights in his in his nighttime life and his dreams um, and um, I was going to show you some pictures at the same time um, share screen um, you mm. oh, why is this not doing this um, Oh yeah, there we are. Yeah, <clears throat> that's better. Um, these are just to show you some of the actors and some of the characters. Um, this is Nigel Hawthorne being the psychoanalyst, Jalal Alga being the priest, Neil Cunningham being the devil. These are all characters who sort of existed in Beyond's mind in his, in his fantasy existence and who kind of created his ideas about psychoanalysis for him. Um, <clears throat> because his idea is that the mind is a group um, he was very interested in groups, both actual groups and the relation between the individual and the group and how the individual is always struggling to create their own identity really against the pressures of the group. Um, but at the same time, the mind is also a group and he felt his mind was full of loads of all these characters who kept sort of talking over each other and would never listen to each other. And he said, how can we give each of these characters a bit of a chance to sort of um, to express their point of view in a way that actually communicates. He was very keen on what he called the caesura, which is um, a point where emotional conflicts sort of meet. And how do you get that caesura to be a receiving screen rather than a blocking screen? And it's the same between different characters within the mind. How do you allow each character to express their point of view in a way that the other person, the other character, because they're not really they're not really characters, they're kind of abstract, what he calls figments of the imagination. So all these apparently 
transparent people are not really people at all. They're sort of abstractions who happen to look like people. So there are some of them, then I'll, I'll sort of go on to, I'll just show you a few of the characters. This is Carol Drinkwater as the mother. This is Alaknanda Samath, who is the ayah. And Beyond describes a kind of reversal of the social situation at the time of the, of the Raj, so that the ayah becomes the queen and the, um, and the mother becomes the servant. And they actually prefer it that way during um, this, uh, this marvelous party that they have together. Um, this is the birth of Wilfred Bion um, with the ayah and Tom Walter as the father. Uh, Bion was actually born in a tent on the banks of the Jamna. Um, and um, well, in, in the way we had it sort of, he is delivered by the ayah and the father. Um, the ayah's foot, this is, this is Bion played by Robert, Burge, Bur Robert Burbage as a soldier in the war, and one of Beyond's recurring nightmares that he said went on throughout his life was um, a, a dream based on an event, that he, event in the First World War in which he was cowering in the corner uh, with shells and dropping all over him. And he felt that these shells were white feathers. White feathers are what people used to hand out to young men during the First World War if they weren't in uniform and a white feather meant you're a coward, why aren't you in uniform? So Bjorn always felt that he was a coward and he had this nightmare that white feathers were dropping all over him whilst he was cowering in what he called his hotel room. So it's made to be like a hotel room in this dream. Uh, but of course, it's actually, um, it's actually um, um, a, sort of a, ru a ruined sort of hovel in, in a French village with shells pouring down upon him. And he keeps sort of thinking, why am I such a coward? And he keeps clinging to this, this compass, thinking that a compass um, can help to show him where he is. But of course, the whole point is that the compass doesn't, doesn't help to show him where he is. Um, I'm not following my script at all. I'm just sort of showing you one or two pictures. Um, yes, Jalalago play, played the bearer played the priest also plays the bearer because all the characters play several several parts because that's how it is in his mind as well. Um, characters take on different um, identities and this is what we call the British Museum because uh, um, they actually created, this was before digital days, so they actually created a life-size a life-size copy of the British Museum for this particular scene which is called The Party which was filmed at night. And this is all. This is a dream of a young child, Wilfred. This is this is Wilfred here, um, <clears throat> and this is Neil Cunningham at this point playing St Peter, who lets um, lets the child come into this this magical party where all all the characters, all the grown ups in his life, are sort of um, having strange relationships with each other, um, and that's him having his having his dream and. Um, the parents find it very difficult to comfort him. First the mother talks to him and then the father comes along. And although the father seems to be very strict and kind of wanting to, wanting to adhere to all the form, all the, all the appropriate forms, you always feel there's a sort of undercurrent, both in the mother and the father, but much more strongly borne out by the ayah and the, and the bearer, in particular the ayah. So it's like, all the child's sort of emotional life is sort of pushed into the into the Indian side of things, um, but it's still there in the in the British side of things. It's just that it's not allowed to show. So you always feel there's a sort of undercurrent all the time, and almost that they'd handed him over to the ayah, saying, "Oh God, I can't cope with this child and his questions. You know, you deal with his emotional life, and we'll just try and get him to behave properly." And so that's that sense all the way through. Um, I haven't got very much. Oh, that's the British Museum in, in full. Um, and this is heaven in the Jamna Bar where they had a sort of mist machine, which are meant to represent clouds of unknowing, which are sort of floating around between the pillars. And they're all trying to have a civilized discussion at this point. Um, <clears throat> again, it's another St. Peter letting people into heaven. Um, 
And this is one of his great quotes, there is some emotional storm disturbing us. And as, as Kumar said, when we watched this film, after, after leaving it for about 40 years, we watched it. <laughs> we said, all right, let's have a look at it. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, that's okay. It looks like an emotional storm. That's what it's meant to do. <laughs> even, if it, even if everything's in the wrong order, it doesn't really matter because dreams are never finished either. And so, <laughs> so long as it gives the impression of an emotional storm, he said that, that that will do, you can show it to people. <laughs> um, um, this, this is Alec Nanda being the Ayo, so he sort of tells him, tells him all the sort of, you know, she, she, she's his, she represents another type of religion. So he has these two religions, you know, based on the Indian, Indian, Indian religion and mythology and on his um, parents' very strict non-conformist upbringing. Um, and at the end of the film, you see him watching his own birth because he's dressed as Hamlet, which represents curiosity, which is one of Beyond's. Um, well, you can't say Beyond introduced the idea of curiosity, but it wasn't there in psychoanalytic theory before. Um, and Beyond said, without curiosity, you don't get anywhere. You, there's no emotional development without curiosity. So Hamlet represents curiosity, which Beyond called the K-link. Um, and eventually he comes to watch his own birth. Um, I better stop now. And I, um, yeah, I probably can't go on any longer, but it's just to give you a vague idea of the, the background of this film and, and, um, and the fact that many of the actors in it, they, they, kept, they kept wanting to finish it and we kept trying to sort of get funds to finish it. And several times it almost happened, but at that point, the sort of English film industry had sort of, well, it was beginning of Thatcherism and everything was sort of artistic was sort of collapsing. And then the Italians wanted to do it, but we couldn't get a copy of the film there in time. And so they dropped it. Uh, and then it just went on and on. But the actors kept saying, can't we do something with it? Um, and so ultimately I wrote two separate things. One was for Tom Walter, um, which he performed in, in a play called The Becoming Room, in which he was be on as an old man, kind of looking, looking back over this dream of the film and try, trying to sort of understand it or remember it, as he calls it, remembering, putting memories together. And, and also a poem for Atlanta, Alak Nanda um, from the point of view of her being um, an Indian goddess, basically, um, reviewing, um, reviewing her upbringing of this naughty boy called Wilfred Bion. Um, so, so many of the actors had, it had a very special place in all their hearts. And we still feel that it hasn't sort of died a death, even though it's a bit like Sleeping Beauty, it went to sleep for 40 years and then people seem to start getting curious, even though they'd all dismissed it, you know, at first and said what a load of rubbish this is. <laughs> I, I think I'll stop there. And, um, thank you, thank you, Meg. Thank you for sharing the background of making and scripting this film. And I'm so happy that you did not give up on this unrealized project. There are iterations uh, on the internet. There's also a narrative poem that you've written for Alaknanda Samarth and uh, a play, The Becoming Room for Tom Walter. So uh, I, I, I'm in great admiration, you know, for your never say die spirit. And that, you know, I mean, through your artistic ingenuity, you have constantly spun new iterations of this unrealized project and kept it alive for us. Well, thank you for kind of discovering it and being interested in it. It's wonderful that you're interested. <laughs> I, I was very happy to show, show the film at CCC. Um, thank you, Meg. And now over to Nina Sugati. Um, Nina Sugati made these uh, three exceptional films when she was studying at CalArts in the early 70s. And um, uh, I was very happy to show these three films at the Camden um, uh, Arts Center public program recently. Uh, and uh, these films have not been shown in almost, uh, I don't know, four decades uh, after they made their uh, rounds in film festivals in the US. So Nina uh, will, will, Nina was also, um, uh, you know, she briefly uh, was in touch with um, Akbar Padamsi and she had attended uh, VIEW. So, Nina, over to you.
Nina, uh, unmute yourself. Oh my gosh, I hadn't unmuted myself. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you for having me on this panel. I really do appreciate it because it helps us um, realize our innermost thoughts and bring it out to the public. And artists are very private people, at least I am. So this is going to be a big help to, for other people to understand my work. Um, I've made a title for my talk. It's called An Unbiased Objective Existence to Make This Possible. I think this is one of the hardest things for all of us to, to be objective. And to live an objective, unbiased existence is a very difficult thing, but, but that's what I want. So did I know that one day my beautifully spontaneous, free-spirited childhood existence today would find this revealing moment of pure consciousness? The Cain Upanishad revealed and made conscious for me the possibility of an unimaginable approach. From where exactly do we emanate and how to surprisingly emerge innovatively from the true source of our beings and raison d'etre, to apprehend and cognize the nature of our innermost selves as part of the invisible and unconceptualizable universal ultimate. The reason I have this prelude to to the actual films is because I feel there is an alternative cinema for the future. And it has begun a long time ago, but it keeps hiding and it keeps coming back. And one day it's gonna come back to stay because um, it's, uh, I, I've given it a name called imageography, which basically means that the truth lies everywhere and it is for the artist to bring out that truth in the cinema. Actors are once removed from the truth. They act somebody else's truth. So for me, when I went into filmmaking, I couldn't go with the actor, actor scene. I had to find my characters in the milieu and in, in the environment. So the Upanishads are after truth. And so are my films. So that is the connection between Upanishads and imageography. Um, is my uh, audio and visual on? Uh, yeah, your audio is on. Would you like to scroll down? Should I put? Then, no, should I put my video on? Uh, yeah, your, your video is on, but uh, if you wish to scroll down. Uh, on your PPT, would you would you like to scroll down and visible to you? Can you see me? Yes, yes. yes. You are yes. visible and audible. Okay, that's uh, yeah. So it could have been this connect between Upanishads in, uh, that grew in truth that that represent truth of long ago, and there's a word in Sanskrit called pragyanam. Pra is a prefix, which means has always been there from before. And Gyanam is knowledge, Um is the Sanskrit part of it. So, so this truth has always been in existence before we were here. And that fascinates me. And I want to find that in my environment today. So when I go filming, real people interest me, their truths because they, each person knows their own truth. And so that's how I combined my study of the Upanishads and the truth of the reality around me. So it could have been this awakening that guided me to form another way of structuring and projecting this innermost arousal. My quantum leap into the expression of imageography in the cine art medium. Would this be for me that new moment in time? What has always existed abundantly from before and now has come back again as pure consciousness in cinema. Okay, now I know that people want to hear about Akbar and Jahangir Nicholson. 
So although I view existence as a whole in my day-to-day -day life and in the context of today's discussion, there are two people who have made an impact on my growth as an artist, philosopher, and film director, though of course in different ways. Jahangir Nicholson, that wonderful quaint man who stepped into my exhibit of contemporary abstract miniatures at Kim Old Gallery years ago, giving me that quizzical, mysterious smile as if he knew something that we didn't. I gingerly went into silent mode. I sensed he was seriously experiencing my meditative works. After quite some time, he paused abruptly at the Yellow Time trilogy. Something had caught his eye. He gazed intently from all angles. Yes, even turned upside down to view it from yet another perspective. Today, I wish I had filmed him in this very precious act of decision-making when choosing a work of art for his collection. He decided on one of the trilogy and then said impishly, I'll take all three. Alas, two had already been acquired, but those people might agree to resell, which is what I'm hoping. So the trilogy can be back together again. He insisted that I send it to him with a non-glare glass. He had looked at it from so many angles to get past the glare on the glass framed painting. Spending that time with Jangu's consciousness, as he is fondly remembered, in that intimately charged exhibit space, awakened me to the kind of perceptive eye for minute detail that the painting could arouse in him of what only he could experience in value. I was completely touched by his very special sensitivity. Oh, where's it gone? Uh, do, it, it's, it's there on the screen. Would you like to uh, move no, on to the next I've got some person doing yoga. How do I get it back? Uh, no, uh, your uh, PPT is on the screen. It's perfectly okay, we can see it. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'll continue then. One second. Yes, please. Zoom. The FaceTime is... Ah, oh, here's the Zoom. Ah, okay. I was completely touched by his very special sensitivity and filled with joy. Occasionally, he complained about the cotton business, which wasn't going as well as it should. We also chatted about photography, which was his passion. However, I would have been hesitant to enter his car in one of his wild moods to drive it super fast, another of his great passions. The resonance and legacy that Jahangir Nicholson leaves in the wake of his physical absence from the world helps us understand and appreciate ultimately what life and his existence really meant for him. For me, art and film is, not, is also about the people who I meet and their inner consciousness. It's, it's, I have to have some of that input, otherwise I can't make the film because the two are interconnected. So I have to, people who buy my work also, I like to know them because I like to know from what aspect they're looking at my work and why they acquire it. On Akbar Padamsi, Akbar for me was an intriguing personality. It began one day a long, long time ago with him also walking into my exhibit at Kemold in the days of Keiko and Khorshid Gandhi. To my delight, he gestured toward a painting he had been asked to select works of art for the Bharat Bhavan Museum in Madhya Pradesh. I was gratified by both his decision and choice and his presence. This was amongst many such episodes where he showed the strength of his quiet, gentle demeanor and the way he went about life. View for me was an exceptional phenomenon that was actually put into practice first time in India. It stood for VI from vision, E from exchange, and W from workshop. 
Artists usually work independently and by themselves, developing an intimate relationship with the canvas or other medium. Here was a place open for the invited to participate and collaborate with other artists, to discuss, air our views and exchange our perceptions something that had not been done in India before. Yes, this was the beginning of a much needed, more honest equation between us. It also encouraged us to share our innermost thoughts and insights. At VIEW, I used his dark room to develop some of my earliest imagographs. We would sit together analyzing, analyzing some and remaining silent about others. It was a secret agreement between us that great art was to be absorbed and relished. Fortunately, I lived in walking distance of Tahir Mansion, a dilapidated staircase led to his studio. It was very easy to be open about my art process with him. And that was his most appealing quality. As I think um, Oshim also pointed out that, or, or was it you, or I don't remember, but but that people liked to, he, he was very nurturing to all students, to all people who wanted to learn something from him. And he was very gracious about the way he shared his knowledge. Yet I need to add that this was just the dawn of a much larger collaborative landscape that still had to emerge for the art fraternity. It required from us a shedding of the I in the ego and an ability to be aware and accepting of our different modes of expression, the way it was as students. Also a genuine understanding of each other's worldviews of our economic, social, political, or even apolitical stance. Fortunately, I now know that this is possible. I sensed that the ferment of work can be realized over time. Perhaps this new altered reality of the pandemic may harness our energies differently. The increased cyber activity in some ways could facilitate our communication on a different plane. The recent quiet solitude that envelops us is highly conducive for a deep within contemplative and meditative approach. It will kindle dormant energies that will inspire more challenging ways of creating. Akbar had once said to me, art cannot be taught as such, but I can convey what it is to you through what I myself have experienced of it. And that was really what I kept going back to him for and getting confirmation on how I was growing and in, my, in the art world. And, very, and I felt very reassured that he was in agreement with the directions I was taking. These two giants of our art heritage made me poignantly aware that we need to share our consciousness for us to really not share our insights, not share our thoughts, but something that is deep within us, what we call consciousness, we have to share that for us to really flourish and realize our fullest potential as an art community. For my imageography approach, please immerse yourselves in my three film poems that are being screened online from 12th to 19th May in conjunction with the John Lee Nicholson Art Foundation and Exploded View panel discussion. So for a future of cinema that is alternate to the one we have now, and we have very often tried it since, um, since the 60s. We have had parallel cinema, we have, alter we have had alternative cinema, but the mainstream is so powerful that, that the, audience is, the audience has to be ready for this cinema that I'm talking about that is closer to the truth, that is not escapist. Thank you. Nina, would you just like to show uh, images from your three yeah. films, please? Yeah. Just very quickly. Yeah. So 
in imageography, there's a geography in the way I frame the space in, in that frame. It's literally the geography of space. And in this, for instance, those three people who are standing there are very alienated. And at the end of the film, that man turns around and waves to that woman. And that, at the end of the film, gives you hope that there is some communication between them. And these words here, I can't understand how life goes on the way it does. I think those words apply now as well to our, to our new reality. So that film has a lot of connection with what's going on now. What's the next slide? Yeah. Um, these two people who are approaching the car, she says that her mother has a tattoo on her hand, which she got in a concentration camp. So many years from now, people will be saying, oh, this is what happened during the pandemic to my parents. So this film is extremely significant for today. This was a man I met uh, in Venice, in Los Angeles. And he had a philosophy that no matter how rich you are, you can't hire someone to play the violin for you. You have to put in full-time work on anything that you decide to do in life. And it was his own personal philosophy. And he was a working class person. And, um, that philosophy attracted me to him, that he had no education. So a lot of this thing, when they say that Upanishads is for the elite is all is not true. It is more needed by the people who are not elite, in fact. It is more needed by people who are having a rough time surviving. So it, it just that it was hidden from people in the past, and now we can bring it out again in the right context. Thank you, Nina. That is really lovely. The way in which you managed to talk about your memories uh, of, of, of Jahangir Nicholson, uh, to talk about uh, your memories of you, and, and also to briefly acquaint us with your three experimental films that you made uh, at CalArts in the early 70s. And um, I think Ashim is not uh, there, but perhaps uh, I, I can uh, begin. Oh, Ashim, perfect. There. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that we've all gone beyond our stipulated time. But one of the reasons why I allowed this as a moderator is because I think we really don't get to hear these stories on a daily basis. So this is really a unique occasion. And I wanted to honor that because normally I would have just, you know, said, okay, we all need to sort of really, you know, speed it up. So um, uh, an observation and a question for uh, Ashim. Uh, there's something about your fascination with archives that has to do with bridging the lacunae. Uh, in events in a cloud chamber, it's a lost film. In the case of your film, Miss Lovely, you are dealing with the underground archive of soft porn films. In the case of John and Jane, you explore the invisible biographies of people working under assumed identities. Uh, you seem to be playing the role of an archaeologist or a detective, working with modes of disclosure. disclosure. So uh, is this something that you'd like to respond to? Um, yeah, I think that's that's quite uh, accidental. Um, I, I don't think that's some like, you know, like it was a manifesto. I think it was uh, something that just happened because I didn't feel things were being represented. I mean, like when I hear uh, Nina speaking right now, like I'm very moved by that because I feel, where are those voices? Like, why didn't we have access to those voices? Why was I always told? And, and, and that means also parallel cinema. I'm sorry to say this, but I feel like I only got two options. I got Bollywood and I got parallel cinema. Neither were, were the options for me. And I didn't get these. Why was I not shown Nina's films? Why was I not... You know, so I, I think, uh, unfortunately, the archaeology is not because I want to, to really do that job. I think it's just that I find that there's stuff that's fascinating that's there and no one really seems to know it. And sometimes I'm just a bit like, okay, if I don't dig it out, and this is what happened with Akbar, I just went and met him for tea. And now I'm a bit like, suddenly I'm responsible in a way, or at least I feel responsible that this film gets preserved, you know, restored, that we talk about this, that this in environment 
uh, is is then bequeathed to the next generation of filmmakers and artists. Uh, otherwise, we're not doing our job. So I, I I don't mean to play this role, and, I, and I'm sometimes a little embarrassed to do it. But I just feel like these worlds are important to us as makers. And that's all, you know. But also for theorists, uh, you know, yeah. in a way. To, to reread artistry, to read artistry against the grain, which is something that I've been doing over many years. Yes, very much. And I, I think like, for example, even the role, I, I think even just as basic as the role of women in, in, yes. in all of this work. Yeah. I mean, you know, View, as we know, was seen as a very male-centric uh, uh, institution. And it would be really great to know how, what do the women feel, you know? Uh, so just this, this, these parallel histories are fascinating, you know? Absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, I, I was talking to Prabha Mahajan, uh, who's, uh, who acted in Maya Darpan. It's also the, uh, is also KK Mahajan's wife, and also to Lalita Krishna, who's a film editor in her own right and was yeah. um, uh, Manikal's wife. Yeah. So, um, talking to um, many of these uh, women uh, uh, who were associated with the workshop, who were observer, uh, who, who observed many of the discourses that were performed there, uh, you you have this feeling that they that, that their voices were never really represented, yeah. and uh, and it's something that we we it's a lacunae that we do need to address. Um, and that's why even in CCC, I tried to find ways in which uh, I could annotate uh, this history and bring in other subjectivities. I want to just ask you a follow-up question, Ashim, which is that on the one hand, you let the Im images decay, disintegrate, as in events in a cloud chamber, uh, to talk about the artist aging body, the gaps in memory, the lost film. On the other hand, you have this commitment to restoring the lost and broken to attention. Uh, these, I don't see them as opposite actions. How do you see them? No, because I feel that there's a, there's a, there's a form for a, for a certain film and, and that's dependent by the thematics of that film. That's independent of our, the need for us to have history. It's, it's, it's two separate things for me. So that in this particular case, for example, decay was part of the form of the film because that's one of the themes of the film. But that doesn't mean I would let everything decay. That doesn't mean that I would not want a history or a parallel history of, or, a, or, or to archive lost histories. I think they're not, uh, in, uh, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. So for me, no, not really. I think preservation is, is um, and, and, and like I said, I'm also not a fan of, of, of this fossilized uh, kind of uh, establishment preservation. You know, sometimes I, I have this very weird uh, relationship to buildings when I see them in Europe. Uh, sometimes I think, why have they over-preserved this building? Like there's something about a building that's not entirely preserved or entirely restored that, that is actually more authentic, you know, because that's probably closer to what it looked like when it was made. So there's these questions also about preservation and, and then building another, I don't want to build another establishment. I don't want to build another status quo as a, as a filmmaker or as an artist. I don't want just because something's restored. Now that becomes a new canon. I think we have to keep questioning canons all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why it's counter canon always. Exactly. You always have to have counter narratives. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's exactly what it, I mean. Uh, I was just playing devil's advocate when I said, yeah. you know, these are not opposite actions. These are not things that, you know, I mean, yeah. on the one hand, you let something decay and fall apart. On the other hand, you're also, you have the zeal to restore. So you want to restore Sizigi. You yeah. also uh, wanted to restore the, 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 the archive of soft porn films. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I mean, wh why should those films not be restored exactly. just because they are, they are seen lower down in the hierarchy of filmmaking? Yeah. Um, with Nina, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, your pedagogy at CalArts uh, in the early 70s. Uh, how was it? Was it, uh, you know, doing crits? Was it peer-to-peer -peer exchanges? Who were your teachers? And importantly, uh, did you participate in the protests, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the protests against um, the Vietnam War? Uh, were you out on the streets as well? Uh, yes, I was. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, I think it was before CalArts, actually. At CalArts, uh, it was an amazing place and Vision Exchange Workshop and CalArts, there was something in common between the two because it encouraged uh, working together as groups, in groups and imbibing from each other's cultures and everything. 
But um, Kalas actually is a place that was Disney, Walt Disney actually envisioned a place where all the eight uh, art forms could collaborate. And then he passed away. And so his brother took over the mantle and he built the place. And it was so amazing. There were 30 students in the class. And um, we were told after two weeks, take a camera from the basement and go make your film after two weeks. And I couldn't do that. I was the last person to go there to get a camera to make my film. And there were five or six cameras still remaining, which means their equipment was like 30 cameras, more than the students in the class. The infrastructure was absolutely incredible. The professors were all practicing artists and, um, you know, people who like Don Levy, who had made time as for BBC, uh, an Australian guy, but then he went to London and then he came to Kellogg. Then uh, Robert Nelson, I'm sure you've heard of Odem Watermelons. He was very experimental. Then uh, Paul Landau and Pat O'Neill. Pat O'Neill was amazing. My world of all intelligence is made with many layers. And it's because of Pat O'Neill that I was able to do that. I have two layers in the camera, two on the Oxbury, two on the optical printer, and two on the animations. Uh, animation and Oxbury, I think, are the same. But there are six layers in that film, and the exposures have to be mathematically calculated. And Pat O'Neill was a wizard at this. And I could only make that film because of him. You know? And the counterculture, well, Yes, uh, I was, it was the first time that I was aware that somebody like John Kennedy, who is such a charismatic personality, but what he does behind the scenes that I discovered in America. And I, I think my first uh, lesson in politis, politics happened in America, that I understood what they say and what they do and how the scene is completely two different scenes, you know? So I would say that I was politicized a bit in America, not, not before I went. Thank you, Nina. Uh, over to Meg, um, what is the relationship between early linguistic experience and the life of the mind? I'm particularly intrigued by the figure of the ayah who has the potential to become the Mem Sahib and overturn the political and social hierarchies. The nanny mother figure introduces Bayan to Indian myths and an Indian life world. Bayan, as we know, spent his early years in Mathura. And during your presentation, you talked about this tension between uh, you know, the, the Indian part of his mind and the British part of his mind and how both of them, bo both these parts were trying to, uh, you know, try, trying to take over his, his thinking and his consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes, that, that, that's the way he presents it. Um, um, that there's a sort of a sort of conflict between you know the, the two worlds, and you feel it doesn't exactly correspond to the actual figures, but they kind of become like like dramatists. You know, they become like dramatist personae, sort of in his mind. You know, they they each have this this role to play, and he he, he keeps trying to get them to speak to each other, sort of inside his mind, you know, his internal group, can they communicate rather than just bouncing off each other and sort of going back and hiding into their, hiding into their shells, he calls it exoskeletons. Um, he says, how can we, how can we create an endoskeleton, which is to say, um, um, an organic sort of life that grows from within, that shapes itself from within. Uh, and we're always kind of shaping ourselves from without by sort of going to hide like a he says, as if we were invertebrate animals. We're not invertebrate animals. We don't go and hide in a shell and then go and hide in another shell. Um, we're supposed to grow our skeletons from within. And that's, that's how our mind is supposed to take shape. But that, that only happens if you can get a sort of internal dialogue going rather than just having a sort of confrontation where the, the seizure is kind of, um, is this blocking screen and the meaning, he said, the meaning doesn't penetrate. 
and he, he has two characters called Psyche and Soma. He says it doesn't make any difference whether it's psychos psychosomatic or soma psychotic. He says they're, they're the same thing because the point is uh, the psyche and soma, which get separated at birth, um, have to find a way of getting back in touch with each other because you can't really have a true sort of um, a true kind of mature thought unless it's actually based in those pre-verbal pre realms, which were originally um, just took the form of bodily sensations. Um, so every, every thought that we verbalize, which you might think is very sophisticated, but it's not real unless it's got those, unless it's sort of linked up with those pre-verbal roots. Um, he makes a whole sort of picture, everything kind of, um, you know, it's a bit like sort of revolving spheres inside each other, you know, they all kind of revolve inside each other and they kind of touch at various points. Just a follow up question to this, Meg. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, the trope of dream play, which is what which is one of the centerpieces of your criticism and uh, and art. And you are the author of a scholarly study on dream sequences in Shakespeare. You've explored the relationship between the surface plot and what you call deep grammar of dream life in this book. How has this influenced your relationship to theater uh, and to cinema, especially Kumar's film? Uh, and, and and how do you relate this to Bayan's semi-autobiographical fiction? I think always when we're, when we're trying to read, in a way, like, like sort of reaching down to the pre-verbal, in a way we can read any work of art in these two, two ways as well. You know, we can read it in quite a sophisticated, superficial but intellectual way. Or we can try to sort of... Um, try to make it contact, try to get at the dream level, which also makes contact with our own dream level. And then, and that actually is what helps us to grow our own minds. If we can, if we can get that deeper dream meaning out of any, any, any form of art really, whether it's a film um, or, or a Shakespeare play or, or whatever it is, if it's, if it's going to last, if it's got any enduring qualities, it's, it's that dream level that makes it last and we need to find our own way to sort of um, make contact with that because that's how it sort of gets into us and then it comes out in different forms in whatever the individual happens to do in life. It doesn't have to be an artistic kind of activity, you know, but anything that involves real intimate emotional feelings, anything that really matters, um, we, we can use art for that if we can but it's quite difficult to make that dream contact. Um, I, that's quite an art. We have to learn to do that. Um, I agree with that, the dream aspect, because a lot of my work, uh, I wake in the morning and it's motivated by what I've dreamt. And I have more faith in that because it's in the subconscious and, and doesn't have a linear mind that structures it. So dream for me is very, important. Mm -hmm. uh, to connect this, uh, even in my, just one thing that will, yes. um, Meg will be interested in, is that in the Mandukya Upanishad, there are three states of being. One is waking state, then the dream state, and then the third is deep sleep. And you are made up of all three, and it's the dream State that reveals to you what you can't know in the waking state or in the deep sleep state. I mean, I said this for Meg because she's, uh, you know. Mm. Yes, that's that's good. Yes. Thank you, Nina, for the intervention. And a follow-up question to you, since we are talking about the workings of the mind, of dream play, the subconscious. Uh, would you like to talk about your imagography approach in relation to the, the subconscious, in relation to revealing the subconscious of your protagonist? Yes, uh, that's a very good question because I don't write a script. I, I do my script with the camera. I take the camera, I find my characters, and I follow my characters in their life. And try and bring out their subconscious. So basically I choreograph with visuals and with sound. And later on the editing table where the graph gets made, I um, decode the images. Because what I went in 
was something I thought, but that may not be their thought. So I decode what is their thought, and then I structure the editing according to the character's subconscious. So the editing, the subconscious of the characters comes into that. And then sometimes at the end of the film, something is revealed to me that I didn't know at the beginning of the film. And unless that happens, it's not, for me, it's not art unless something like that happens. So these quotes are very interesting because in one of the quotes it says, this is when I was making the film from an old book of mine. Um, in one, in one of the quotes, it says that you may know the you may know the person and what the person is saying, but you can never know the actual experience of that person that's making him say that what he's saying. So to unravel that in a film, you will tell me. Suppose you say something to me, I can understand that, but I can never know the experience that you've gone through that's motivating you to say that. And to me, that's extremely important to know. You've got to know the other character as well as you know yourself. Yes, so as a follow-up question, uh, this is for all, for all the panelists. Uh, how do you get to know your protagonist? How, uh, how do you, in a way, coax uh, the, the subconscious truth out of them? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wish to ask a question to all of you about the, the relationship or the tension between artistic autonomy and the agency of the protagonists um, in your films. Now, the, the reason why I'm asking this is, for example, in, in Ashim's uh, film, Events in a Cloud Chamber, um, of course, Ashim, you talked about your camaraderie with, uh, with, with Akbar. And, um, even as I when, as I see the film, I, I I almost feel as if I'm mesmerized by the atmospherics of it. When uh, when you show Akbar making the grid, uh, you're thinking about you know you're, you're annotated as a modernist grid, but you could also uh, look at it as a kind of tantric diagram because of the way in which you shot it and the way you shot it is penumbral, classic Ashim Aluwalia style, right? Dark penumbral reality so um so uh, now so th th there's one aspect of it which is this affective register which i really relate to but then there's another aspect which is that the the akbar i know which is akbar who is extremely pugnacious who is argumentative who is very vocal about what he likes what he dislikes and um i mean i was me I, uh, I used to often meet him un until you know the last few years before he passed away when he was more housebound, and um, you know he he was always uh, you know he he was always very clear about uh, you know his own opinions his insights, and somewhere when I look at the film I feel that I miss that other Akbar, uh, the 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 Akbar which you know the Akbar who will you know immediately throw uh, you know an idea or an opinion at you. So, so that's that's a question to you, to uh, Nina. Uh, I would say uh, so. You're you uh, you know in in uh, in breaking ground. You're looking at a dysfunctional African American family. In um, hope no one's listening. You are looking at people in the halfway house. Their minds are on 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 the edge, um, uh, or a hobo in in um, in in a world of all intelligences. So. Uh, on the one hand, I understand your approach, where you where you talk about how you 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 know you you are able to uh, coax something out of your protagonist, something which which reveals a version of the truth, uh, and that is of course a provisional truth. But on the other hand, uh, what happens to the agency of your protagonists uh, if they were to see these films? How would they respond to the way they have been characterized? So that's a question to you. And uh, because we are running out of time, I'm just kind of have, I have a common thread uh, for this question. Uh, with Meg, I'm sure this question of this tension between artistic autonomy and the agency uh, of, your, of, of, the, of the protagonist, whether it's in a film, in, in a book, or in, 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 in theater, uh, is something that you must have dealt with, uh, you know, constantly in your work. So Ashim, would you like to go first? 
Yeah, so sure. um, so I think I think one of the myths of of documentary or documentation of film to begin with is that it's a it's a factual representation of something. I think that's that's as we know, it's a sort of Godardian quote, like it's the ultimate lie, right? So even if I'm whether I'm making fiction and I'm flagging it as fiction, or I'm making documentary per se, I'm making a portrait, um, it's filtered through who I am, and it's in a way it's it's me actually. So that's Akbar as through me. That's not Akbar as you would know him. That's Akbar as I would know him, or I would maybe want to know him only in the context of that particular film, which is very internal. It's the Akbar that we don't want to see. It's the Akbar that is not going to tell you what he thinks because he's got a different mask. Maybe when he's a uh, when he's the like you're saying the uh, the um, you know the more vocal, the more outspoken. It's not the nervous Akbar. It's not the it's not the Akbar who's uh, unsure. And I was very interested in that aspect because like I was saying, uh, a lot of, of these heavyweights, mostly men, always came across as very self-assured and confident and clear about what they felt. And I, I always felt, you know, there's something disingenuous about that because I'm an artist and I don't feel that confident. I'm constantly questioning what I'm making. And so, I, so when I was engaging with Akbar, I think I decided to make that film just because he revealed that vulnerability to me. So I, I think the shadow area that you talk about or the sort of, let's say going back to you know what Meg's talking about, the idea of the sort of unknown or the latent, I was very interested in that aspect. Things that even he didn't realize he was nervous about or he was unclear about. Um, and, and just one thing I want to say, which I think makes it very difficult for uh, you know definitely filmmakers like Nina, definitely me, I'm, I'm more practical in a way. I, I guess I understand the strategy of how to be able to make things in a very difficult environment. One of the things I want to say, and I think that's also one of the reasons why Kumar's film probably didn't get traction, is that Indian cinema comes from theater. It is specifically plot oriented. And this is something we must really understand on a deep level. It's very much coming from plot, from character, and from narrative. It doesn't come from atmosphere. It doesn't come from texture. It doesn't come from tone. So what happens in our film tradition is often filmmakers like us or writers that or particularly filmmakers, I would say, who are outside of the narrative tradition, plot oriented cinema, they not only are ignored, they can actually offend uh, an audience because they are bypassing the very language that people understand cinema to be. I didn't understand the story is a very common uh, kind of complaint of, of Indian audiences, right? Why? Because the expectation is that the story is meant to understand. You are meant to ha you have a pact with the filmmaker that they will give you a plot that you can digest, you can follow. The minute you go into dream states, the minute you go into states of fragmentation, tone, atmosphere, light, texture, those things, and things that come from an experimental film tradition or from poetry, that is where a disjunction happens. So it's much harder for filmmakers working outside of the narrative tradition in India to make work. In the West, there's still a window, there's still a world for that. Here it is, it's alien, it still remains. That's why we're still in the same state. I don't feel like we've moved from the time that Nina's making films or Mani or Kumar or whatever. We're still in that, we, the reaction is still the same. It's not moved forward. So that's all I wanted to say with regards to form, I guess. But you can also work in the interstices between the tradition of narrative, the narratival tradition, and the language of abstraction. So I think th those are also other possibilities. It's a, it's a war. Be, it's a war. Yeah, it I doesn't mean, have to be yeah. only the narratival tradition. No, no, sure. But I think the, yeah. the reception, the way film yeah. is received yes. as, as, a, yeah. as a form and yeah. what you're allowed to do yes. with the word film. Yeah. That's where now the gallery comes in, you have yeah. to sl slip over into the art world, et cetera. But I'm saying that that is something which we are still struggling with as film practitioners in this country, I think. Yes. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Um, but uh, Nancy, uh, Ashim says that I find it difficult to make films here. I just want to modify that a bit. I love making films here. I'm, I have a full equipment set up and totally independent and i love it i'm very happy yeah so, no sorry i should clarify I, yeah. where mm. you're right but i think it's the reception it's not so much the baking it's the reception and the acceptance and the distribution and those things you know yeah the distribution yeah. Distribution. Yeah. making of it is this place is fabulous yeah it's full of films you know? yeah that's true awesome is a film 
the other thing what Nancy was saying is that, uh, you know, it depends also what you're interested in focusing on in your film. What is the main thing? Is it some people just want to do a good story and that makes, that's fine. Some people want to just make a documentary on a specific person. But if you're interested in the angle of truth, of knowing what is our innermost desire in life, you can't do it through words. So that's why when I take my camera, I'm filming shapes, I'm filming light and shadow and maybe the side of a person, not the full person. And if just a few words, maybe because words come in the way of the truth of that person. So, so um, the abstract form reveals much more of truth than the literal reality. And, and the difference between the two, between real reality and the reality you make with, with the film, they're two completely different things. So I, the, the reality of Sasuji today, for instance, is the, it's, uh, of the environment. But I'm not interested in reproducing how you see reality with your own two eyes. I want to uh, show something that's hidden, that's hidden. Um, and that actually Satyajit Ray saw my film, Chatrabang, he saw it, he came to Mumbai to do a mix and he said, uh, I've heard from Berlin that your film is exceptional and that I must see it. So I took him to the Eros Theatre, you know, that little theatre on top of here. And just he and I sat, he's a very big man and he was stretched out on that armchair. And, and after the film, he said, you know, this is the most fascinating film I had ever seen. So I said, but there were no subtitles. How did you understand? Standard. He said, your film doesn't need subtitles. And that was what, that's what I'm trying to talk about now, that we have to understand cinema in a holistic manner. Then we will be able places and open up people's vision as to what the world is about. Just like this uh, virus, you can't see it. How do you show it on a film? That is the challenge, you know, which I think my daughter's made a little film on this, which is quite exceptional, on people going through this uh, pan pandemic. And it brings out this that is occurring in our society and the fear and the paranoia. And you can't do that with dialogues and, and story. You can't. You get another product, you know? So, Nina, um... How did uh, the principal protagonists of Breaking Ground uh, respond to the film? Well, they haven't seen the film. I haven't shown, I have not had a chance to show any of them the film, but I know one thing that they thoroughly enjoyed the process of, I mean, they came to understand themselves in the conversations I had with them. They, uh, they came to understand themselves better because of the film. So to me, what I also like is, I mean, the way in which you used many layers in the narrative. For example, uh, the, the, the man who suffers from the Goria, you actually see his words being amplified on his images. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so, so again, this linguistic subjectivity, which is very troubled, also in a way scatters and, you know, it, turns into um, an entity in itself, on itself on the image. So that's yeah. also quite fascinating. Mining, and mining the words with the graphics. Yes. Yeah. I really yes. think that's important, yeah. Yes. Meg? I suppose that's why film is, is very like dreams and the way that you can combine words and images and you can, you can make words into images and, and vice versa, you know. So, um, I was thinking of what Nancy was saying about um, how about our relationship with the protagonist in, um, in the film. And what Ashley was saying about um, people wanting or needing a narrative, otherwise they can't, they feel they can't sort of identify with what is going on in the film. And of course, what is going on in the film is something much more complex than the narrative. It is this weird mixture of words and images and, and, and those genres kind of getting mixed up with each other. 
um, so that we might think that we're identifying with the protagonist, but not, we're identifying with, um, that's just our way in because it's kind of, we're like children, that's the easiest way to get into something, but once you're in it, that's not really what, <laughs> what, you're, uh, what you're learning from it. And it would be hard to describe what you're learning from it, but it's, it's something to do with the shape and the form and, and the way that, as in any art, it's, it's, it's the form of policies, the way that uh, those are put together that really sort of conveys the sort of dream level of it. And um, I mean, always in literary criticism, when I'm writing about Shakespeare or something, um, I always say to myself, it's important not to identify with the protagonist. Um, once you do that, you sort of had it because you don't really see the whole play. Um, you have to sort of stand back a little bit. Um, and you have to identify with the really horrible characters and in particular with the way they all interact with each other. Um, you know, you have to identify with the, uh, the play as an art symbol. And Shakespeare's kind of done it for you really in, in the poetic language and in the structure of the play, that's, that is his art, is that he's, he's done it for you, but you still have to do a little bit of work in order to stop saying, oh, I'm so like Hamlet, you know, oh, if only Hamlet had married me instead of Ophelia, you know. I mean, you even hear academics talking like that. You think that's absolutely the wrong way to, to identify. You, you mustn't let yourself get into the protagonist and it's a kind of idealism. You mustn't let yourself think this, this protagonist is me idealized, you know. You must identify the same way that the author does with all, all the characters equally. Otherwise you don't get the whole picture of what the plays, the sort of mental, the psychic sort of um, meaning of what the play can present to you. Nancy? Yeah, so uh, I think I would tell you, which is, I think, connected to what we're talking, yeah. is that when I'm choreographing with the camera, I don't, I just, I'm sort of vague. I just take it on the forms and the color and the shapes. I don't necess necessarily go in a linear way, what, what the person is saying and, and not necessarily, I'm, I'm just doing it like, how do I explain this? I, I sense movement around me, you know, and I go according to the movement around me. And um, it's a completely different way of uh, wielding the camera. Yes, I understand that, Nina, and I was not creating a binary between the narrative tradition and the language of abstraction uh, since I studied film myself uh, at FTI many years ago. So it's not about thinking in terms of binary, it's, it's about, um, perhaps if one would like to call it, it's about uh, the ethics of representation. So I think that's what, what I'm talking about and uh, how willing are you to, in a way, give agency to your protagonists. So it's about, uh, the share of agency. Uh, give agency? So, what do you mean exactly? I don't understand. To also allow them to have a say in the way in which their subjectivity gets performed and represented in on film. So that's the question that I was asking. I wasn't asking some kind of, uh, you know, a basic question of difference between a narrative tradition and the language of abstraction. And anyways, uh, you know, I mean, most films happen in the interstices, as I said, between the two. So, uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that we've already gone way, way beyond our stipulated time and Pooja has been very, very patient, but I'm very happy that we've had this discussion. And uh, just one last thing, I mean, which I'd like to say, which is that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, it's, it's like in that Sufi story where the, the mirror, uh, you know, that, that we hold in our hands, uh, we think that's the world, but that mirror is already broken. And we are all holding one shard of that mirror, you know, me, Ashim, you, Meg. And therefore, you know, what, what we see is an interplay of various provisional truths. There is no single truth, but it's also about uh, how, how willing are we to share our privilege with others who perhaps are not able to express their version of the truth. So that's, with that question, uh, you know, I I, um, I, 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 I give over to, uh, to Pooja to make the vote of thanks. Thank you yeah. so much. And so what you said is correct. That happens in imageography. That the characters, the protagonists, they contribute to the film. I don't tell them what to do or say. Because that would, they do contribute. You're absolutely right. It is their life that tells me what to do. I don't go in and put my ideas into there, you know. That's true.
Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say I'm so glad that we did this, Nancy, May, Hashim, uh, and Nina. It's been really, really, it really resonates with me as well because uh, I'm in a position where I'm managing this collection, which has all these guys, uh, you know, from Akbar Pradam C to all the big names that you know. And it's kind of, it, it can get daunting because it's, uh, and I think that's also the flaw in um, art education, you know, because it comes down to you as something that, you know, you've seen, you know, you've been kind of dismissive of this whole part of history in a way. I mean, you study it in art history and all that, but then you feel like you, you know, you, they are, you can't touch that part. It's like whatever has been said about it has been said. There's enough that's been said about Akbar or Suza or Raza, or, you know, you can't really. So I feel like I'm in the position that I do want to kind of open it out to uh, find new ways to look at it. Because according to me, I think even historical material is not just that. It keeps changing depending on where we are today. And that's why I just wanted to also thank you guys because I saw everyone's films and I, I think it's really fascinating, like, um, you know, um, Meg, you worked on that film, which is, of course, really theatrical. I like the way that it's um, set like acts and it, even the way that it's shot is, uh, you know, really like it's happening on a stage. And uh, even Nina's, I feel like there was this whole other experience of uh, taking the language almost like a moving graphic novel, you know, where the words kind of, when you're listening to the words and you're seeing the words kind of move in and out of the frame. So I think that was amazing. And Ashim, of course, um, uh, your film on recreating that film, I think uh, is so amazing because it's not really trying to recreate something, but I feel like it's some, is a person's life and experiences ever completely knowable, you know? So it's kind of going through memory uh, Akbar's memory, your own understanding of it. And I think that's really beautiful the way that it comes together of, of a new effort from what we know or what we remember. So I think it was really nice uh, for me and I'm very glad that we did this. So thank you all. I know I've, we've taken everyone's time and uh, people must be <laughs> ready to eat, be hungry and get to dinner. But thank you for bearing with us. And uh, thank you all thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Really good. Yeah. Thank you.